Hi, I'm Tanisha Carino. Thank you for being part of the Voice of the Patient Summit. And as an Alliance board member, thank you for your continued support and partnership. At Alexion, we're on a mission to transform the lives of people affected by rare diseases and devastating conditions. To achieve our mission, we recognize that every patient's journey is unique. So that means that we have to listen differently, listen with humility to their stories for how our medicines can change their lives. For people living with one of 7,000 rare diseases, this is especially critical, particularly when you consider that only 5% of rare diseases has an approved treatment. So let's close this gap. Patient engagement remains one of our most powerful tools to do this. And at Alexion, it means working with patient communities early in the design of our clinical trials and even bringing our research into their homes. So as leaders, it's up to us to help patients get the care they need. And it's up to us to start by doing this by listening. Thank you. Hi, I'm. Hello. Hello, and thank you for joining the fourth session in the Alliance's 2020 Signature Series Summit on the Voice of the Patient. I'm Kathy Martucci, Director of Policy and Programs for the Alliance for Health Policy. For listeners who are new to the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the health policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. And throughout this three-day event, we aim to study how the patient voice is collected, how it supports shared decision-making, how it is leveraged in policy translation efforts. Um, all to make sure that the patient experience and, the, and is improved and that we are building healthier futures. I want to take a moment to thank our 2020 Signature Series sponsors. We appreciate their support in making this summit happen. You can also join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AHPSummit20 and follow us at All Health Policy. We want you to be active participants in this conversation, so please have your questions ready. You should see a dashboard at the bottom of your screen with some icons. Use the two speech bubble icon labeled Q&A to submit your questions for the panelists at any time. We will be collecting these and addressing them throughout the broadcast. You can also use the Q&A icon to submit any technical issues that you may be experiencing. And finally, I urge you to check out our website, allhealthpolicy.org. We have summit background materials, including speaker bios, resources list, and experts list. And recordings of completed sessions will be made there, will be made available there soon. And now I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Eleanor Perfetto to moderate today's discussion. Dr. Perfetto is Interim Chief Executive Officer at the National Health Council, where she has also served as the Executive Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. She also holds a part-time faculty appointment at the University of Maryland, Baltimore School of Pharmacy, where she is a professor of pharmaceutical health services research. And her work primarily focuses on patient engagement in healthcare, including comparative effectiveness and patient-centered patient outcomes research, medical product development, patient-reported outcome selection and development, value assessment, and healthcare quality. And with all of those expertise, we are so pleased to have her um, moderate this discussion on empowering patients to navigate and negotiate healthcare. So Dr. Perfetto, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I really appreciate being invited here today. And um, I wanna welcome everyone to this session. We're gonna be exploring successful mechanisms to support patient na uh, patients in navigating the current highly complex healthcare system and fostering independence and decision-making um, we're going to look at um, care navigation, digital tools for patients, shared decision making between patients and their providers to help them personalize their care, um, and how the patient's voice um, sh should be and can be leveraged in developing these approaches. So it's my pleasure to um, welcome an esteemed group of experts who's going to be speaking. And first, I want to begin with Dr. Stephanie Anderson. Dr. An uh, Dr. Anderson is the Executive Director of Respecting Choices. And in her role as CEO, she provides leadership for the delivery of Respecting Choices programs, 
bringing over 25 years experience in palliative care and hospice, home care, case management, emergency medicine. She's the vice president of the board for Advanced Care Planning International and co-chairs the National POLST, P-O-L-S-T, Program Assistance Committee. Um, Dr. Anderson earned her Doctor of Nursing Practice degree from the University of Iowa, and she's actually joining us from Iowa today, where they actually have four inches of snow on them. Right? Um, I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Maria Lemus, the Executive Director of Vision et Compromiso, um, and she has served on numerous public health advisory committees, including the Health and Human Service Permanent Advisory Committee, the California Latino Mental Health Institute, for Reducing Health Disparities Project and the California Hispanic American Cancer Society Hispanic Advisory Committee, among many others. She has 21 years of management experience at the California Department of Health Services, the City and County of San Francisco, and the California Department of Corrections. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Riverside, and is an alumna of the National Hispanic Leadership Institute and of the California Women's Policy Institute. We welcome Maria. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Jen Horinja, patient advocate and founder and CEO of Savvy Cooperative. In 2018, she was named the Entrepreneur Magazine's, uh, she was named one of the Entrepreneur Magazine's 50 most daring entrepreneurs. Um, she grew up with juvenile idiopathic arthritis and is a brain tumor survivor. And so Dr. Horinjeff is a patient-centric outcomes researcher, human factors engineer, and an FDA consumer representative. She holds a master's in ergonomics and biomechanics and a PhD in environmental medicine from New York University. So I want to begin by thanking all three of you for joining us here today. As I mentioned, um, we have Iowa, San Francisco, and New York City. Um, so I think this is probably the, the most geographically widespread panel of the meeting. Um, so we're going to begin by having each of you respond to a question. I'm going to give you three to five minutes from your own perspective to talk about and for you to share a, a brief example of a lesson or an experience you think best summarizes why the patient is the patient voice is so important in the sector that you work in. So we're going to begin with you, Stephanie. I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Eleanor, and thanks to the Alliance for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm honored to talk about, talk about this very important topic. I'm gonna share an experience that speaks to aligning care with what matters most to an in individuals. A deep divide exists in the American healthcare system between patients' values and preferences for care and the care that they receive. We know that today, many patients get care that conflicts with their personal values. It's a story that plays out all too commonly in many settings across the country. Evidence shows us that 70% of older Americans say they would want to die at home, surrounded by loved ones. But in reality, 70% die in a medical setting. Think about that. How does this happen? As a society, we imagine that we will be relatively healthy until suddenly we die. The fact is that the vast majority of us will experience a slower decline due to chronic illness marked by episodes of sudden worsening where decisions will need to be made for us. In fact, almost 70% of us will become unable to make our own decisions at some point. Most people also worry about burdening their family, making tough decisions for them. And yet the majority of us have not even done the bare minimum to avoid that situation from happening. This means families are left uncertain how to advocate for what care their loved ones would or would not have wanted. And many healthcare teams are left uncertain how to navigate the difference between all of what can be done in modern medicine to what should be done based on what matters most to this person. So how can we ensure that all of us, but especially those who are the sickest and most vulnerable have high quality of life and equity and care, even during serious illness. The experience I'm going to share with you is the results from a research study led by Dr. Maureen Lyon. The clinical study took place across five HIV clinics in a large urban area. The researchers recruited nearly 450 people, all with HIV, between the ages of 22 and 77. 86% were African American. 40% were below the poverty line, and almost half had a high school education or less. 
there was also diversity of sexual orientation. These researchers wanted to know if, by having advanced care planning conversations, there would be better understanding of individuals' preferences for care between the individual and their surrogate decision maker, even if that individual preference has changed over time. These individuals were helped to identify a surrogate decision maker first, and then each pair participated together in two facilitated advanced care planning conversations using the Respecting Choices program known as Next Steps. Researchers then separately interviewed the patient and surrogate to see if they each had the same understanding of the patient's treatment preferences. Now for the impressive findings. First, in this vulnerable population, fear of engaging in advanced care planning conversations was not a barrier. Almost 100% came back for the second conversation and remained engaged throughout the study. So why weren't they afraid and why did they stay involved? Well, when the foundation of a conversation is to first discern what matters most to a person, to learn who and what is important to them, their goals, their values, their beliefs, before ever discussing preferences, people feel respected. They feel listened to as a person and not merely thought of as a diagnosis. So in the words of study participants, or better said for this, the voice of the patient, I quote, everything has been moving toward a positive direction after starting this study in terms of not stressing so much and thus my health improving in terms of weight gain after losing 30 pounds from stress. And from another voice, it's kind of a little bit like therapy because I'm talking and it's like I'm not getting judged. This study found that early advanced care planning was not feared, as I said, it was welcomed. There was decreased anxiety for patients, their surrogates, their family and other loved ones. The conversations provided, and I quote from many voices in this study now, the conversations provided peace of mind. Secondly, there was increased congruence between the patients and their surrogates. The surrogate knew and reported the patient's preference accurately, even as those preferences changed over time, demonstrating the enduring power of the conversation. So what's behind that? Again, let's go to the voice of the patient. I quote, up until now, I never put much thought into everything. It has also made me realize how much I was asking of my surrogate to do on her own prior to this study without my input. Now I know she's better prepared. I know someone is going to stand by me, making a commitment to honor my treatment preferences. Conversations matter. Early advanced care planning before end of life that includes a surrogate decision maker can be an effective mechanism to bring peace of mind in navigating the healthcare system. Through opening lines of communication and building a trusting foundation, conversations continue even outside of a formal advanced care planning conversation, leaving a well-prepared surrogate to advocate for individuals who don't currently feel empowered or represented in our healthcare system. So it's been my pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, present this important experience, elevating these critical considerations as we work together to hear the voice of the patient in healthcare. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions after my colleagues are finished their presentations. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a great case example. Maria, I'm going to go to you next. Well, Stephanie, <clears throat> I really appreciate what you just said. Um, I think that it's relevant to what I'm going to be saying in a few minutes. Um, I am Maria Lemos, founding executive director of Vision and Compromiso, and I'm really pleased that we are celebrating our 20th year this year. We started as a grassroots organization with a few of us who grew into a few more, and before you knew it, we're uh, really a national organization supporting promotoras y trabajadores comunitarios who are community leaders. We're primarily a Spanish-speaking organization, and we're founded on the belief that we have community experts that we call promotoras. They could be your mother, they could be your grandmother, your uncle, your aunt. It's a historical reality that we've had these wonderful men and women since Eve was a grandmother, and we they're un they're unrecognized, um, and, but they're they're essential to our communities, whatever community that you live in. They're just called a different term. We happen to call them promotoras. Um, and what, what is, I think, profound about the movement, um, since we've been organizing and bringing these uh, wonderful leaders together, they, they first wanted to know a lot, a little of a lot of information. 
because they were always bringing information to the community. They were those bridge builders. I think if you look at a literature review, you'll find that, that in particular in chronic disease and with research studies, we're really effective for education and outreach. And I think that's been our, our um, kind of our, our mainstay. But I do want to I, I do want to say that what, what we say is that promotoras really have a role from preconception to death. There is a role for us in anything, and I appreciate what you said, Stephanie, because I really truly believe that that from getting as a young as a young person ready to enter as into parenthood, or from zero from birth from zero to five in, in early childhood ed, or as you're you're in hospice or palliative care, or you're ill. There is a role for a promotor in that education and information, but now through navigation of services. Um, in terms of the, the patient, um, what we find that, that promotoras are, have always done is they've always been that conduit of information, kind of the interpretation of the information. They, they, they For instance, in um, let's look at senior services and um, the system that exists in the, in the United States. How is it that a senior can really um, find relevant service in their senior service when they don't like the food, it's too far, they don't have a car, they can't, they can't uh, get there, and, um, and they just don't understand the system. So what we've done, what the community does, is that the community then builds alternative systems, and the promotora is kind of that, that, um, that bridge to those alternative systems. So the example I'm gonna use is we have a core curriculum called Transforming Communities, where we really uh, support the, the leader, provide a lot of leadership and, and, and training. And our first cohort was at Clinica Ole, which is a farm worker clinic in Napa. And it was with the clinic asked us to come in and give this training to 20 patients that were diabetic. They were all farm workers. And in the evenings from six to nine after they came off the fields, we started this training. And um, they, they asked us, so the nurses brought in some things for them to munch on. Um, broccoli, carrots, dip. And then they noticed the next day that they didn't eat it. And they asked me why. I said, well, I don't know why. So I asked them and they said, well, they don't eat broccoli. It's not, it's not common. They don't eat cauliflower. <laughs> they don't eat those things. So I said, well, what would you like? So they said, why don't we bring what we think is, is what we eat. So the next, they took turns. The next time they brought a nopal salad, which is an amazing healthy food. They brought um, chayote. They brought all these foods that were really relevant to them to share healthy foods that they knew. Well, that was an extraordinary, extraordinary event for me and for the nurses because they never thought, well, why not ask them what is it that they will eat? They just gave them what was the, the quote, the American version of, of healthy food. But, but the, the takeaway from here is that in each culture, we have our own healthy indigenous historical foods. How do you honor that in a system that doesn't understand it? The nurses didn't know what chayote and nopales were, and so they couldn't integrate it into their recommendations. From that class, we have a senor who we call Don Jesus, and Don Jesus continued with the adventure. He's part of our network, and he developed, he started informally cooking um, Mexican food, in a healthy, nutritious way. He was so taken by this diabetes class and, and our training. So he developed something called me veo bien, me siento bien, which is I good, I feel good. But it's more than that. His, his philosophy was if I get up in the morning, I dress up, I go somewhere. I mean, I put on nice, I wash my hair, my, brush my teeth and I go somewhere and I'm eating healthy, then my emotional as well as my physical health will improve. And so this male bien, me siento bien, turned out is one of our, our core classes as we look at chronic disease and behavioral change. And he, he started to teach classes. We have it all over the state now. It's part of our curricula. And this is an example how community understands, is able to interpret some of the things that they're told. Now in the clinic, they said, eat better, eat this, exercise, walk. Many things that he, that he couldn't do and they couldn't do because it wasn't relevant to them. They didn't understand it. The other piece to it is what we call bioterapia. And so in addition to that, we developed an exercise program that Promotoras developed based on how they, it's a wellness exercise. So they come, they talk about nutrition, they do an 
our version of wellness exercise. And then they hang around afterwards. They stay afterwards and they talk. And so you have a little support system. They, and we now certify promotoras to do this. They do it in the communities. We cover their insurance. They do it in rec centers and parks in the summer. People walk to it. They don't have to pay a fee and it's, and they hang out with their friends. So those two are examples of how community has been able to develop systems to support their health and well-being. They're not on track. They're not, they're not, um, they're not val validated or even recognized by the institutions. But when they don't have access to services, when they don't understand what's be what they're being told in the quote, the, the typical mainstream way, communities are able to develop these kinds of systems. And, the, and what we say is that we really want um, agencies and, and uh, the public health system to look at partnering with community, that going to scale is partnering with community. There are so many Latinos. I'm a Latina. My parents are from Mexico. You know, when I was a child, we had a lot of Latinos, but now exponentially, I'm overwhelmed by the number of us that there are in the United States. And how are we going to provide good service to us with a few community health worker positions that we can, we can uh, support financially in a system? You have to partner with community. And that's where we think that that dotted line, that bridge to community, supporting these community programs, honoring the community programs and the expertise that exists is the way that we're going to be, we're going to be able to mitigate and also to, um, uh, to support uh, better health in our communities. Yeah, thank you so much. Great examples that you provided. Jen, we're going to turn to you. There we go. Because I follow directions, I muted myself. All right, I'm off. Can you hear me? All right. Well, thanks so much again for, for having me and to my other co panelists. Thank you for sharing your stories. It absolutely all resonates with me. You know, you can kind of see behind me my tagline that our organization, Savvy Cooperator, has is Ask Patients because as you have both identified, we need to understand the, the priorities and the preferences of the people living with certain conditions or their caregivers and understanding sort of that community approach as Maria was just talking about. So my story, my background is I am somebody who considers himself a patient. I've grown up with several chronic illnesses. Most notably, I was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis when I was an infant, along with several other autoimmune conditions. I did have a brain tumor removed, I guess, seven and a half years ago. And so I certainly have been uh, you know, influenced by my patient lens. Truthfully, I thought I was going to become a physician, you know, as a sick kid, that's what many sick kids think, oh, I'll go on to be a doctor. But I was actually disenchanted by our healthcare system, seeing that my physicians couldn't even practice the medicine that they wanted to. So instead I became a human factors engineer and human centered designer trying to think about like, how can we design the world for people like me who have limited mobility or things of this nature, rather than just excluding people that don't fit the mold of what you know these people sitting up in a room have designed for them. I then went into academia. I was studying patient-centered outcomes really in clinical trial outcome measure sets or treatment guidelines to try to make sure that we can understand what matters to those patients. Because you know, so much of this happens. If we take a clinical trial, for example, you know, the drug developers and others that are involved in that research are just saying, these are the measures we care about. Then 15 years later, a drug comes to market and we talk about you know, the almighty shared decision-making, but if we haven't measured what matters to patients early on, then the patients don't have the information that they need at the bedside or in the clinic to make those decisions with their clinician. If a patient like myself with autoimmune conditions says, well, which one is going to make me less tired and fatigued? And if we haven't measured that, then how can they make a decision that works for them in their lives? And so all these things were what I was sort of seeing. And because I'm very vocal about my patient experiences, what was then happening is that colleagues were turning to me and saying, hey, Jen, you're a patient. We weigh in on this committee or that project. And at first, sure, I was happy to. But then as they kept coming back to me, it really signaled an access and diversity problem. Because obviously, as somebody who's white with a PhD and lives in New York City, it cannot possibly speak on behalf of 54 million Americans with arthritis. And I was uncomfortable being asked to do so. And that's really sort of where Savvy Cooperative, my organization, was born out of, was how do we make it easy for these two sides to connect? Because otherwise, 
you're just going to be talking to kind of, I consider myself a, a low hanging fruit, if you will. I was easy to access because I already had a seat at the table. And if we only ask those individuals, then we're only going to innovate for people like me who may have, you know, higher health literacy or different socioeconomic status or certainly, you know, bias towards certain race or ethnicities, genders. So we need to really be thinking about how do we actually do the work to reach those individuals? And so Savvy Cooperative is actually the first and only patient-owned co-op. So we're member-owned by patients and by individuals that allows those innovators to connect directly with diverse patients or caregivers. And like I say, our model is very different. We empower our members to then go into their communities in culturally sensitive ways to find people to participate in things like focus groups or interviews or surveys or things like this so that we can capture those voices. So we're not a typical advocacy organization. We don't do programming or policy. All of that is amazing work. We love to partner with those types of organizations, but we do the one thing of just trying to make sure that we're not skipping over this stuff because it's hard. We don't know where to find patients. Oh, that's too hard. It takes too much time or effort. And so that's really sort of the problem we're trying to solve for. When it comes to thinking about, you know, where are some real world examples? I mean, I could, I could go on forever, but I'll give you one example, thinking about sort of like a policy standpoint. I know we're in the era of telehealth now. Many people were very surprised to learn that, you know, during the pandemic, I had my very first telehealth appointment because I, you know, live and breathe health innovation and have been a patient forever. And I had my very first remote rheumatology appointment and people were surprised by that. But so often I have so many specialists, they were not the first movers in sort of the telehealth space. I live here in New York City. I'm from outside of Boston originally. I have many of my physicians I still see there, but because of state lines, I wasn't allowed to have telehealth appointments. I would have to you know, pay $300 for a train ride out to Massachusetts for, I, I joke, my neurosurgeon appointment, love him, but the appointment's about like 120 seconds because he just pulls up, you know, last year's film and this year's film and says no tumor and then I leave. But it cost me that much money to go do that kind of appointment. And so I think that trying to understand what those frictions that patients run up against rather than just guessing and then getting it wrong. And my least favorite term in healthcare is non-compliance because we label patients with being non-compliant, but we actually haven't done the work from the beginning to understand what are their needs, what are their priorities, does it fit seamlessly in their life? Or are we just coming up with new solutions and throwing it on them? That's what I'm seeing a lot of in the pandemic is, oh, cool, telehealth here. Now you're going to use that app and none of it works together. And we're just now making the patient have to figure it out and we haven't done the work. So thank you for having us to have this important conversation. And I hope we can talk about more ways to ask patients so that we can make sure that these things are actually solving problems that patients have. Thank you, Jen. Well, I think um, all three of you touched upon some, uh, some points that the National Health Council is very sensitive to and that we've been doing a lot of work on. So I think we can have a great conversation. I think I heard a theme going across all three of your presentations that had to do with uh, engaging patients and co-creation. I mean, certainly those were the top things that I think came out of all three in terms of common threads. So I wanna jump in and ask you a question while we wait for some questions from the audience to come in. So please, by all means, everyone submit your questions but I've got a few to kick things off. Um, in terms of that idea of engaging patients and having them really be involved in co-creation, um, can you talk a little bit about, um, in terms of your creating models for doing this and how you've been doing it? And what are those kinds of successes that you've experienced? But what are some things that, that you've seen that could have been done a lot better? Because I think our audience can learn from good examples, but they can also look to the examples that they should be avoiding also. So um, does anyone want to have something in mind that they want to jump in? I see Stephanie's got a smile on her face. Maybe, maybe you can jump in, Stephanie, and, and share. Sure, I'm happy to share. Um, one of the strategies we have used, um, there's two, actually, that are probably the most um, successful engagement strategies. One is um, a, if a trusted doctor tells the person that they're caring for that these conversations are a, a part of routine health care and really important and why, the rationale why, and then listens to them about if they have any fears or worries or concerns about these conversations. That's huge. That's one of the most successful engagement strategies. The other and my favorite is the use of stories. So I will tell people that I um, bribed my two children when they 
for legal adults, young legal adults to have a 15 minute conversation with me. Um, I couldn't motivate them any other way. Um, so my husband and I, they were 18 and 20, um, and my husband and I asked them for 15 minutes and it was a two and a half hour conversation and it was one of the most powerful conversations our family has ever had. It opened up streams of communication about their um, preferences and their health. They could relate to if they were in a car accident and had a week where they were unable to make their decisions that mom and dad weren't automatically their decision makers any longer and thinking about that. So finding finding a story that's relevant to the person you're talking to and that they can relate to the situation. If I had started by saying, you know, someday if you have cancer, heart disease, you know, what would your, you know, no, uh -uh. let's relate to who is in front of us and what's important and relevant to them. Oh, I paid for dinner and a movie for each of them to take a guest. <laughs> okay, very good. Very good. Yeah. Uh, oh, Pre COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, do you want to jump in there? So what we do is we really look to the community. So we'll, uh, in our comites, when they come together, uh, we, our structure is that in each region, the leaders come together in committees and comites, and they define what their issues are under health, immigration, and education. But we really look to them as experts. And so we ask them, uh, we just ask them questions. What, what do you think is the issue? What do you think is the solution? How would you go about it? How can we help? And then we, and then we formalize that into a curricula or into workshops. Oftentimes they participate, they're the ones who are trainers. And so we do a lot of training of them to be trainers um, and to lift up their expertise. That builds a lot of credibility in the community with us with us as an organization, but also credibility that the expertise is in the community. And I would say that what's really important is to not just go in there and say to community members, uh, this is what we think, but rather let's have a conversation. What do you think? Much like Sefe said, let's just have a conversation because there's a lot of already professional intimidation that goes on when uh, someone with some degrees comes in and, and starts to ask. Um, and there's a lot of weary, weary, weariness and wariness about people doing that in our community. And so there has to, you have to establish that relationship first, I think, or work with agencies that already have that relationship to be your gatekeeper. Um, but what we do, and I think what has made us very successful and legitimate in the Promotor community and trustworthy is that we don't build things out of the sky. We just, we, we start the conversations on what's important how can we help you? What do you need? What resources do you need? How does how is it relevant to your community? So that in the Bay Area, it could be different than in Madeira in the Central Valley, which is where I am right now. So different from the Bay Area, I cannot tell you. I, I mean, I'm driving through fields of cotton and, and almond trees, and there's no relationship to being in Berkeley. So we have to keep it in perspective to that particular community. Um, Jen, I want to switch gears a little bit with for, with you. You technology when you were giving your opening remarks. And so I want to um, ask you to talk a little bit about your thoughts on um, how patients can be using um, technologies, digital technologies, other technologies, or um, how, can they, how can they leverage those to be navigating um, their own care? I think you brought up, um, uh, you know, there's so many things that are being developed. And, and it's one of my pet peeves is um, yeah, let's just throw technology at patients, but not, but, but not think about how they can best leverage that technology. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Ooh, all right, well, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to condense it, but I think yeah, you've already identified one of the issues that I've already mentioned, right? We don't know if that tech is helpful or not. I mean, we work with so many different types of companies and we work with a lot of like, you know, the big pharma companies and they come to us and we say, hey, we want to know if, you know, we should make this support app for patients with, you know, this therapeutic area. And we then have conversations with these patients. And, you know, a lot of the time they're saying, please don't make us another app. Like, I don't need another <laughs> app. And so, but, you know, I'm glad that they did the work to find that out because they needed to validate that that was not the way to go. So at least they asked. Um, but I think that these are the kind of things that even from a, what is the right tech, and I can't describe what is the right technology for each individual, but I think it also goes to show sometimes you can have technology and you're still running up into these issues, which again is why patients should be involved in the design. So I'll give you an example. 
people and certainly well. So like I said, have lots of specialists. I had a new specialist appointment coming up and I had my, you know, Apple health kit. I had all my records from all my other Epic portals pulled into it. And I had this new specialist and they needed my health records. Well, we're now a couple days away from the appointment that of course I booked like six months out. And they said, well, we need your records. I said, fabulous. Look, I got them. And for those who are clinicians can already expect what's coming. They say, no, we need them directly from the doctor because we need the doctor's notes, which we know is a problem. They don't give them to us lowly yeah. patients. And so I didn't have the doctor's notes. Okay, well, actually you can also see what's coming is that I needed now to be able to fax the old doctors or the old hospital system, the request, and then they would mail me a CD-ROM of my records. And none of this could happen because, A, I don't have those machines. It's, like I said, 2019 at the time. But <laughs> then it's just, I couldn't do it. So I did everything right. I had the technology. I had the apps. And yet I still couldn't. So I had to cancel that appointment that I waited six months for. And it's just another way that this isn't working. So I don't know, you know, what the right technology is. But it's not just about the standalone technology. The app was fine. All these portals, they're fine, but do they talk to each other? Do they give me the information that I need so I have agency and autonomy, or am I always tethered and fighting with the system to make anything actually happen? So it's not just thinking about have we asked patients to like, you know, say if they like our UX and UI, it's really going through the whole process and seeing if it works for the patient. Yes, great, thank you. Um, I, I have some questions that have started to, to pour in. So um, let me take one of the audience questions for you. And I think it's one that you can all jump in on. So um, the, the person asking the question says that they're enjoying this conversation and um, their question is related to several others that have come in. So would you speak to the interrelationship between culture, health and healthcare delivery and how these variables are impacting patient engagement and a few other uh, individuals have also um, asked questions about um, engaging with seniors, engaging with low income, engaging with minorities. And I think all of these are kind of circling around the question that was asked about culture, health, healthcare delivery, and how all of those variables impact engagement. So Maria, I'm gonna start with you. I think that's a really important question. Um, the, is I, it, my feeling, is that initially uh, healthcare providers are trained in a certain way and it's very narrow in scope. And, uh, and they may not have that cultural um, humility, the cultural awareness and the, cult the cultural understanding of who the communities are that they're serving. Um, and so that puts, immediately puts a barrier between the communication. If, if for instance, it, well, I'll give you an example. My mother had diabetes. She didn't speak English till the day she died. She was on Kaiser. She went to Kaiser. They gave her something. She brought it home, didn't know what to do with it. They told her to go eat, you know, go eat this food. And she said, am I going to eat that? You know, am I going to go to sleep? It took us an intervention of a, somebody to come in and explain it, to walk her through it, and to explain the importance of it. That cultural piece is really important, but I, I don't want people to put the onus on, the onus should not be on the person. Uh, the onus should not be, why don't you eat better? Why don't you go walking? Why don't you get better? Don't you understand? I've heard providers say, well, why don't they just do it? <laughs> you know, and, and when you walk into a room and there's already that assumption on the provider side and people can feel it. Mm -hmm. um, people can feel a provider's warmth or lack of and immediately a barrier goes up, a, an emotional barrier. I think that I would really love to say that to providers that how you walk into a room and how you greet and treat a person from that minute that they see you will impact the conversation later on. And not to mention, do they understand what you're asking them to do? And do they have the resources for them? That's why these programs in the community were built. A doctor said, oh, extra, you know, you must exercise. And like, uh, and they say, go join a gym or go walk something. They don't understand that. That person may not have the facilities. They may not, it may not be safe where they're from. Maybe they can't walk by themselves. They don't have a partner to walk with. There's a lot of those things that are really important that affect our health and our well-being and understanding what that provider says. So I think beyond cultural, it is looking at the socioeconomic environment. Where do they live? How, who, what's their support system? And for seniors, being a senior, 
since I hit the senior age, the whole discussion about who we are and we're, that we're treated like um, seniors are, are so disregarded, I can't tell you. The minute you tell people your age or and if you're ill, there's a whole perception that happens about seniors. And I think it's it's disrespectful to us to have an assumption about a senior person, someone over, I guess it's over 60, 55, and, and what is it that they can do and they cannot do and what support system they have and they don't have. I think we're all gonna get there hopefully. And I think we need to build up those systems of support for our older adults. Maria, I, um, I'm glad you clarified because and when you said that you were a senior, I thought, well, she doesn't look to 85 to me. So how can that possibly be? But <laughs> <That'd> be true. <laughs> Well, even that. So, uh, Stephanie, do you want to jump in? I'm like, she doesn't. She doesn't look like a senior to me. So, I don't know what she's talking about. I agree. Um, I I really like Maria. You saying that the onus should not be on the person, the individual. Um, and I would um I, I would balloon that uh, to I uh, Jen. You said that one of your least favorite words is non-compliant. One of my least favorite words in the way it's used is trust in healthcare, because people keep saying that we need to get people to trust us. And by us, I mean the healthcare side. And I completely disagree, completely. I think the onus is on healthcare to become trustworthy of people that, that want and need um, our services and our care. Um, so I think that's a, a launching point for us. Uh, and of course, that's not a hit the easy button and that can happen next week. Um, but I think if we don't think about some of these foundational issues that Maria and Jen have both referred to and start focusing on um, fixing the foundation and nothing else on top of it, you know, it's like building a, a really high skyscraper. If you don't spend the time underground setting the foundation, the whole thing will fall down. It won't work um, over time. And so I think that's really key. Um, I also think that um, I, I've, I've hopefully learned through listening that we can learn mm -hmm. about cultural beliefs, um, but that every single individual within any culture, seniors, race, and, um, ethnicity, whatever that is, doesn't mean that every single person that identifies with that culture, um, that belief, has the same belief. Um, and so recognizing mm -hmm. that even though somebody may try to put me in a group, um, that I may not identify uh, with the same. And so that right. speaks to, brings us full circle back to what all of us have said, let's talk to that individual and find out what's important to them, what their beliefs are before we ever make any assumptions. Absolutely. Jen, did you have anything that you wanted to add on this question about um, culture and, and social determinants? I mean, I think that it's it's been stated, but it's just recognizing and having that that vulnerability to understand that you don't have all the answers. I think you have to start there. And certainly, you know, we need to be sensitive to these things. If not now, then when, you know, there's a lot that's been happening, um, you know, civil unrest over the past several months that is long overdue. And what we're seeing is that companies are, in, you know, health systems are finally paying attention. The amount of requests that we get now to specifically talk to Black and Latinx and Native American communities, because people are saying like, ooh, whoa, I guess, I guess we need to talk to them and to understand. And so I'm just glad people are doing the work, but that it takes that. And one of the things that I find myself saying over and over again is realizing that these things take resources and that people don't a lot for this. And they think that people should just then come and give away their insights for free. And I know this is something the National Health Council really thinks about as well around fair compensation, which we all need to think about. So many people think, oh, it should be out of the goodness of their hearts, which many people do, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have value. And that's the part that is always frustrating. We pay everybody else in sort of this ecosystem, statisticians, designers, other professionals, but yet we think that patients just owe us something because we're gonna do good things for them down the line. And then that's really what I think is unfortunately causing more barriers to have those diverse perspectives if you're not doing the work to make sure that you're making it accessible for these you know, individuals and communities that have been left out to participate. Yes, uh, Jen, I would add to that. I think um, in the last few years, um, attitudes about compensating patients for their engagement activities has changed. Um, it was probably about seven or eight years ago I heard an individual from a pharmaceutical company say that they had a policy that they would not pay 
the patients that they were engaging to gather information from them. It was against their internal policy because they believed that patients had to have skin in the game. And I informed that individual that they do have skin in the game. They have bones, they have circulatory systems, they have livers, kidney, hearts, all of that is in the game for them, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, fortunately, that, that poli those policies have changed a lot. Um, Jen, you started us off on a track of what barriers might be, and I'd like to, for us to have a conversation. What are the policy barriers that are out there that are keeping these kinds of programs like the ones that Maria has been talking about and, and both of you have been talking about, uh, Jen and, and Stephanie also, what are the policy barriers that we're seeing out there that keeps this from happening and keeps the need from being translated into those policy discussions to move the needle forward on this much more universally than pockets here and pockets there? So um, uh, Stephanie, let me start with you on that one. Sure, um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to speak to this. I'm proud to have been asked to be part of HHS's um, emergency declaration um, work under COVID. And, um, and it was, could I use the word horrifying? Um, maybe that um, speaking like what Jen, Jen is talking about, the idea of politicians saying, I think this is a good idea without asking the people that it's gonna impact, without asking the people to do the work. So, so kind of from that lens, um, I will bring a bright spot out and I'll tie it to um, compensation for patients. Well, we also should be uh, compensating community health workers and others that can develop these skills to supplement a community clinical uh, model. And rather than, um, I'll use advanced care planning billing for an example. So there was reimbursement codes established several years ago to pay for advanced care planning conversations, but it was physicians, and other qualified professionals that were working with the physician excluded the rest of the country that could develop expertise and skills in having these conversations. Very narrow focus and focused on a profession that doesn't have the time um, to do this work and do it well. Um, and so that's just one example. But on the flip side of that, policymakers are listening right now with, with the pandemic um, and they're, they're hearing and they're working to make positive change in my opinion. Um, so I've been, I've been pleased over the last several months with the progress that is possible now. That's great. Maria, I'm sure in your 20 years of experience that you were talking about that you've seen a number of policy barriers. Could you jump in? Well, thank you, um, Stephanie, for mentioning promotoras and community health workers. You know, we started as primarily volunteers, the moms, the dads, the grandmothers. But over 20 years, we've seen the, quote, professionalization of our work. And there is a, there is a, um, um, there is a continuum of promotor in the community that's still a volunteer. And the community health worker that is an institutionalized position within an agency. Um, but but there still is no um, there's still no respect for the work in the community and, and I, I want to go back to that dotted line and the CMS ruling. So when the CMS ruling came out, uh, we were really hopeful, especially with whole person care. We, I really thought that whole person care would include the promotor and that there would be this dotted line to community and we would really be involved in, and and so whole person care was with the institution. It is. It is that person who goes out into the community, but there is no really relationship to the promotor, to the community piece. And that's where we talk about going to scale and how you can impact more people. There is, right now, seeing this really as a policy, it does allow for reimbursement within that circle, within that whole person care circle. But what does it do if a community health worker, like in LA with whole person care, is from a community and they're doing the same work, but as the community promotor who is not being reimbursed, who doesn't receive the base salary, who doesn't have benefits. And so there's so much um, disparity between the, the application of policy and promotoras and community health workers who are we, how are training um, the whole issue of certification, which we do not support. We think you should look at core competencies, not at core certification, because it draws a line in the sand. Um, the whole professionalization of our work in the community by those who are not promotores or community health workers, tends to intellectualize the discussion. And I think that, that to me is a big disservice is, is um, medical professionals or academic professionals taking what is a community activity and community worth and intellectualizing in a way 
that they think it will fit into a project, a program, or an, instead of really talking to the community about how should it work best. There's a disassociation there, and there's a disrespect for the community expert, the community expertise when we don't sit at the table asking us again, what do you think? How can this work better? How can we engage community? What do you suggest? Who should be, who should be a natural partner in this process? Instead, it's decided, it's developed, it's a, and then it's completed, and they say, here, take it and go, go for it. <laughs> and nobody knows what to do because we have been part of the process. Yeah, yeah, I, I do like your phrasing of the whole person care idea. So not so much concentrating on, on what, what happens in a single healthcare visit, but what happens when that person walks out the door from that visit and all of the services around them that need to be connected. Um, and the policy barriers that we have for that. They should be with, I mean, promotores and community health work should be a center of, of that. And, but there is, we aren't. Yeah. Across the nation, we're not. And so we're not there. Those, are, those are intellectual, professional barriers that prohibit, you know, coming into our community and saying, how can you help us? Right. Um, Jen, do you want to jump in on the, um, on the policy barriers that you, you've encountered? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the policy barriers that kind of bubbles up for me and we get questions about all the time is around some of these perceived barriers around working with patients, especially when it comes to, you know, drug development and what are FDA or EMA like regulations and things like this. And I think that's what's challenging is everybody's looking for, you know, as Maria was just saying, like a line in the sand in some regards, like, what can I do and what can I not do? And there's not any sort of specific guidance on these are the activities you can do. And I think that this because things aren't spelled out, and not that I'm saying that they need to be, but that there are organizations that skew to one end where they say, well, then we won't just, we won't do anything because we're too afraid to have, you know, our wrist slapped for something. And so they kind of take a much wider way of uh, approaching, you know, patient engagement thinking, well, then I can't talk to anybody because I'm too afraid that this is going to be you know, out, out of compliance. So that's one of the things that I see from a policy standpoint that it is creating some of these perceived barriers for doing the work. If people actually stopped and understood like what is, what's the actual spirit of what we're trying to talk about when you think about drug development? Yeah, you're not doing off-label marketing. You're not trying to, you know, do, get people to take your drug when they shouldn't or, you know, get them into your trial if that's not the appropriate mechanism for you to be doing this. That's what these things are for. It's not like if you want to understand disease burden in a, you know, a therapeutic area that you're not in yet, like that's bananas to think that that's not allowed. And so I think that those are some of the things from a policy standpoint, we just see people kind of blowing it um, out of the spirit of what it's trying to do. Right. And, and I think we've come a long way, I think in that area, but we still have a long, we still have work to do. I think it was probably I think, you know, five, six. Yeah, years I think what I'm just seeing is that you just see that there are organizations that just are on sort of a different end of the spectrum there, that some organizations are very innovation forward and they're looking at it more critically to see, you know, where is the line and where can I go with this? And there are the ones that we kind of consider more innovation proof that are the ones that are just too afraid to take that next step. You, um, we've skirted around this issue a little bit in some of the previous questions. And so I'm gonna ask maybe a little bit more directly, you know, here we've been, with um, COVID looming, looming over our heads for most of this year. And it's really put some pressures on, especially individuals who have chronic diseases, disabilities, um, it, with their be, ability to access care, their fear of what's going on, their trust of the medical system, of the healthcare system, um, and care pressures, you know, what happens with their visits and things like that. Could each of you talk a little bit about what you're, what you're seeing or what you're experiencing in terms of challenges and bright spots in what's happening in, um, in engaging patients in their care during this time. We touched a little bit on digital health, but there are other aspects of this. Um, and I think it's that aspect of the care pressures that patients normally would have, but then magnified because of, of what's going on with COVID. Um, Stephanie, would you, you wanna jump in on, on some of that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so the 
unfortunately, COVID has been the ideal use case for the importance of care planning and seeing the gaps when care planning um, and identifying goals, values, and preferences hasn't happened. Um, but with, with crisis always comes opportunity and innovation. So, so we have, um, uh, for those clinicians and, and lay people on the phone, uh, we have a, a Respecting Choices COVID resource toolkit that has some conversation guides and some other tools to help. What we have found is that COVID has made thinking about your own care planning um, real for many more people than ever before, because any one of us could get sick, any one of us could end up on a ventilator not being able to yep. communicate our own wishes. And so um, the, the innovation that we've seen outside of digital is that clinicians that have been re um, purposed because they're, they weren't as busy in surgery or they weren't as busy in clinics, et cetera, were repurposed to have phone calls with um, residents. I have a testimonial from Michigan that they, they had a cadre of people that were helping care facilities, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, helping residents and facilities have these telephonic conversations, and they experienced nothing but relief by those re residents, relief that somebody was having this conversation with them because they've been thinking about this. What if I get sick? Do I wanna go to the hospital, et cetera? And being able to have those conversations and then bring their, their caregiver, their loved one, everybody in so everybody's on the same page. So it's more about helping manage their symptoms and helping them to achieve their goals and their preferences rather than crisis decision-making when that person gets sick. Maria? You know, I, I, I'm sitting here kind of really sad because in our community, um, you know, Latinos in particular, um, Spanish-speaking immigrant Latinos have less access to health services. And they are, quote, in the essential workers, either in urban and rural areas. And so my sadness comes from they're having to work, they're having to come home to a home that has multiple families that doesn't have the resources, they don't have health insurance, and they don't have the, 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 uh, the flexibility of going to my second home to, to write this out. And I've, I've, so, and, and I've, I've received a lot of calls from uh, promotores and community members who are, who are sick, who don't have resources, who don't know where to go, who don't, who don't even have food, who are losing their jobs, who are losing their housing, who, the children are home, the adults are home, there's all this drama in the house and they don't know how to handle it. There's no resources for them. So they asked us several, uh, a while ago to develop something. So since the pandemic started, communities like us have been providing webinars and trainings and now we're into charlas, which are informal discussion groups. We're providing uh, resources on wellness issues as well as what is COVID. We have a presentation that we did on the physiology of COVID. What is that little thing? How does it get in your body by, by a, a medical doctor who's on our staff, a promotora? And, and so we're providing as much information. We and other community agencies are doing as the state and the counties are not doing it. So there's a, a, a real disparity between information getting out to a community in a way that's understandable. A flyer is not going to do it. The CDC and, and the state have a lot of information, but there's standalone flyer kind of not interactive information. Communities are really stepping up and putting that information out in a way that's understandable. Reason. We're also providing you know, really active in food distribution and housing and support services. But this is going this has gone on for a long time and it's going to go on longer. People are so sick right now and they're afraid to step out and say something. You know, part of the the um, part right now in California there was a very quietly said immigration raids. Nobody talked about it. You know, there's so much fear, so much anxiety, so much distrust, and, and all this, because of the election, all this information going across about it is, it isn't safe, wear masks and don't wear masks. There's so many conflicting, uh, so much conflicting information that my sadness comes from. They're not being a coherent message. They're not being support services, support for organizations like ours to really go deeper in the community. And there isn't support for that or the community health worker who are being laid off also and uh, and don't have anywhere to go or anything to do. You know, we all have families. We all have children. I, I don't even want to talk about what's happening to our next generation of children who are in school. Um, distance learning is for those who have a computer and who have somebody who can help them with that. 
there's so many implications to COVID for older adults who don't have access to special needs children. Uh, it's so complicated and we're not discussing it in greater detail and we're not helping offering services to our grassroots organizations to provide for this for our community. Well, Maria, that's very sobering. Thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. Um, I'm going, we're, we're almost out of time. And so I know that there are going to be people who are going to be dropping off. And if you need to, by all means, my last question is just uh, not really a question. It's to give each speaker an opportunity just to say some final um, closing words. And so um, I, I, want to, I want to also thank our speakers very much for the fantastic job that they've done. I have many more questions that have come into the chat. This could have gone on for easily another hour. Um, and I'm, I'm actually wasting a little bit of time to give each of you a few seconds to think of what you want your closing remarks to be. Um, and and I, but I do want to thank the audience for being great about being engaged and providing these questions. Um, and I'm sorry that we were not able to get to all of them. There were just so many. Jen, I'm going to begin with you with the closing remarks. Could you jump in, please? Well, thank you again. Thank you to my fellow panelists. This has been a great conversation. My message is always the same and simple. Just ask patients and keep doing it and see that you need to do it early and often. There's always a touch point that needs to happen regardless of the type of project you're working on. And I said it before, and I hate to be focused on money, but set aside the resources that you need to make this work happen. It doesn't just appear out of you know, thin air. So I just challenge people to continue to, to do the work and see it as a priority, that it's going to actually help you do your job better if you're out serving your community the way that you say that you are. Great, thank, thank you. you, Jen. No one and done, that's, for, that's my mantra. One and done does not work. Uh, Maria, please, please jump in. Well, I know I just gave that sobering <laughs> comment, but I must say that what what gives me a lot of hope and and uh, and satisfaction is knowing that community is going to figure it out, and I'm very hopeful for that. Like today, I'm in Madeira. We're doing a caravan. We're getting information out. Promotoras are doing it themselves. You know, that's their solution is to develop some really creative ways of helping our community. I would look to community. I would engage with those leaders the real community grassroots leaders, the promotoras, the community health workers, every state has this, this group, this informal group. Um, happy to connect people to the groups in the other states and, and happy to, to answer any questions. We are here. And um, when you're around us, I just want you to, to learn about promotoras, engage with us. We're a very happy group. You know, when you're around, um, Promotoras, it's like being around family. It's like a boda, and a boda is a wedding. It's a very engaging, uh, happy place. And because we're naturally happy people, I guess, but I would encourage you to get to know who we are in the community to really engage with us and, and ask us for to participate, ask us for advice, and ask us how we can help. Stephanie, close us up here. Yeah, I just want to thank the audience for their interest and um, the voice of the patient. And my ask or my challenge to you is to go back to whatever work you're doing and see how you can elevate the voice of the patient, no matter what it is that you're doing. So thanks for listening. That's a wonderful charge to the group. Catherine, I'm going to wrap it up and turn it back over to you and, um, and, and hope everyone will help thank um, our, our wonderful panel. And um, staying on the theme of asking the patients, um, we really want to make sure our programming is relevant to our audience. So please take the time to um, fill out a brief evaluation survey um, that you'll receive immediately after the broadcast. Um, this feedback is really invaluable to us. Um, and I also want to highlight our day three sessions and encourage you to join us again tomorrow at 11.15 a.m. Eastern time as we continue to explore the voice of the patient. Um, thank you all again. Have a good rest of your day.